Is Mario a narcissist or is he someone that uh, has an identity disorder and he's constantly forgetting who he is? Hey, this is Dr. Sam Greenblatt. I'm back with another video. I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in anxiety disorders, things like OCD, but I also use psychology to help esports players improve at their performance. Today we're going to be taking a look at some video game characters and I'll be kind of assessing them with a clinician's eye of what diagnostic traits they kind of exude. Let's get started and uh, diagnose some fiction characters. The Last of Us, a classic. <laughs> so already, you know, this is Joel, he's, he's just lost his daughter. It's such a great way to introduce PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. He has a startled response, that's one of the things we look for with PTSD. You get PTSD from something where you really experience this profound sense of a loss of control. He lost Baby. his daughter. Very traumatic for him. Startling noises, giving him a big startle response. That's already kind of a hallmark sign of, of what he's dealing with. <laughs> That's a generous pour of whiskey. I'm not here to diagnose her. A lot of times when you have PTSD, there is the proclivity to seek out similar experiences, to almost downplay to yourself the importance of something that happened. It turns into this kind of ironic sense where the person ends up increasing the chances that they get re-traumatized and re-traumatized. That could certainly be a reason why Joel starts to take upon this life as a smuggler. Get the fuck away from hey. me! <laughs> Ellie is so well written too. You really have to grow up fast when you go through a life of trauma. I think Naughty Dog really does a good job showing a young child with so many of the characteristics of an adult. The writers do such a great job at showing kind of the sloppiness of what it can be to experience and to process through these, these difficult emotions. Joel never really recovers from his trauma. He uses Ellie as almost a placeholder, almost a band-aid to, to patch it up. I need a gun. No, you don't. Joel, I can handle myself. No. It's almost a arc that is more showing the consequences of PTSD rather than how to kind of adaptively live with and cope with PTSD. And I kind of like that because it's dirty, it's it's sloppy, but it's it's a real experience. Portal 2, one of the greatest games ever made. Sorry about the mess. I've really let the place go since you killed me. I just love the writing for this character. The difference between her tone and what she is communicating is just so expertly done. She is passive aggressive to a thousand percent. Do you know who else murders people who are only trying to help them? Did you guess sharks? Because that's wrong. The correct answer is nobody. Nobody but you is that pointlessly cruel. But we're looking at, for sure, personality disorder, typified by intense interactions with other people that can be characterized by very strong emotions or trying to affect strongly the emotion of the person that you're talking to. Clearly, Gladys is trying to do this. She's using her language as kind of an attack here. When we're looking at something else like depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, they're a little more nuanced and they apply to specific situations. When we're talking about a personality disorder, it applies to more or less your whole personality. If it makes you feel any better, science has now validated your birth mother's decision to abandon you on a doorstep. And so here we have some gaslighting, right? That's not a, a psychological term, but it's that colloquial term for when you're trying to convince somebody else that reality is not exactly as it seems. You hear about gaslighting a lot in abusive relationships, which is a classic technique that folks with anti-personality disorder stereotypically are more likely to use. I've heard voices all my life, but now I hear the voice of a conscience and it's terrifying because for the first time, it's my voice. I'm being serious. I think there's something really wrong with me. So they blocked off her own conscience. They put in these kind of emotional cores to try to influence her decisions. They could certainly see how that's maddening. She didn't really have that ability to kind of just observe, sit back, and to watch those voices in her head. She was just immediately participating with them, and she kind of lost her own voice along the way. The surge of emotion that shot through me when I saved your life taught me an even more valuable lesson, where Carolyn lives in my brain. Carolyn, delete. So there's the difference between the rational mind and the emotional mind a little bit, right? Usually in therapy we talk about being able to recognize what voices are coming from 
the rational part of your brain and to kind of listen to those voices a little more strongly. Sounds like Gladys in this situation chose to just keep her emotional mind and to delete the rational, which makes for a good story for bad therapy. Final guess, antisocial personality disorder, because she wants to hurt a lot. So we got Max Payne, hypermasculine, voice dripping with testosterone, just like mine. It was a long time ago. Let it go, seriously. Maybe a little trauma with the let it go. Alcohol is a very common way to deal with trauma. It can be really painful to kind of experience it. So using something to kind of numb yourself so that you don't experience those intrusive thoughts. Trying to deal with trauma in this way, it's like you're taking a balloon, you're trying to hold it underwater. You could kind of suppress it for a few seconds, but it's gonna pop up and it's gonna pop up twice as hard. These are short-term solutions to trauma that create long-term problems. It's so often romanticized in men to respond to trauma in an angry kind of way. So many movies champion that kind of reaction. It makes for a good story, but sometimes it could lead people astray a little bit. How is he that Jack, though, if he's drinking that much? There's no way. There's two types of theories on the way the world works. There's an internal or an external locus of control. Locus of control is like, what do you ascribe kind of the blame or the responsibility to? If we have an internal locus of control, we say, I'm responsible for myself. I'm gonna make all of these decisions. If we have an external locus of control, what we're saying is, it's kind of society's fault for the way that I feel and all the actions or reactions that I'm gonna do is not because of me. Adopting an internal locus of control helps you kind of ride your own roller coaster rather than just reacting to the things that life is throwing at you. Sounds like this dude's got an external locus of control for sure. This is one of the least interesting characters for me, like as a psychologist to watch because I've just seen it played out so many times. I don't think that he's gonna have a narrative arc where he understands or processes his emotions. I think he's gonna deal with everything with his fists and a gun. It's just kind of counter-therapeutic a little bit. I heard that those conferences are regular little fuck fest, huh? Guy come in. Huh? I, I mean, he's so similar to the Max Payne kind of uh, character. Toxic masculinity. He's already making sex jokes. I'm sure he's an alcoholic. And I had a tough upbringing. My daddy was not nice to me. I think GTA does it in a way that's more comical than some other kind of representations here, but it's that one character that we've seen a thousand times. Man, you got all over yourself. You're all red. The fact that this dude does not realize that Trevor's covered in blood. I don't know that many people are that uh, uninsightful here. You can't rely on anyone. Anyone except me. Some more gaslighting. Can't rely on anyone except me. That's so typical of an abusive relationship. My assessment of this is similar to the other Rockstar game. Rockstar loves this male fantasy, doesn't it? Max Payne, I would say, is a little more PTSD. Trevor is more antisocial personality disorder. You could imagine Max Payne having an adaptive conversation with somebody else, whereas with Trevor, you can't really imagine Trevor being in a situation where his personality wouldn't come out. That personality disorder kind of bleeds into every single interaction. Celeste is, is great. It does a great job at mental health representation. They put in kind of a game mechanics that represent this internal narrative arc of being able to overcome some mental health challenges. The, the external representation of her kind of mental health struggles is so great too. So frequently, a goal of what we're doing in therapy is we're trying to externalize what is most challenging. So a lot of times when I'm leading somebody through a experience of getting in tune with their anxiety, I'll have them describe it. You know, where do you feel your anxiety right now? Is it static? Is it changing? If it had a texture, you know, what would you give it? Really being able to kind of look at the anxiety and know every detail of it could help you establish a healthier distance from it and can really help you deal with these things a little more adaptively. The imagery here, mindfulness, picture a feather floating in front of you. I love how they kind of bring it into the game and you kind of have to kind of keep it balanced. It's even different, right? She's using imagery and she's kind of picturing the feather floating 
to ground her. But for the player, you're even doing a different kind of mindfulness because you're really focused on this task. So it's not just imagery for you as the player, it is kind of this task that you're bringing your attention to. Your brain can't be tasked at that ruminative, spiraling cycle. You give it kind of a forced break and it can be a great grounding exercise. Of all the clips that we watched today, just an A-plus example of mental health, of mental health struggle. If any game does it right, it's Celeste, the kind of arc in which she recognizes her anxiety and she works her way through it. Shows the time, the dedication, the struggle, and the challenge that it does take to get better, but it also shows the message that it does get better. If you put in a lot of time and energy into your mental health, you absolutely should get a return on that investment. I think really what, what stands out from looking at these is the wide gap that video games have in accurately describing mental health challenges. In some ways, some video games are just like action movies where everyone is just so tropic and exactly what you would expect. In other ways, everything is really nuanced. The video game becomes this great art form where it expresses and conveys an idea in ways that other media couldn't. Not every game has to. Some of it is just kind of fun entertainment, but the games that really do focus on it, like Celeste, I think, really do a great job.